Hi, my name is Jennifer Ott and I'm a historian with HistoryLink and I'm going to talk with you today about the Olmsted Park system in Seattle. And um, Seattle has amazing parks. They are spread throughout the city. They are oases of green in the urban environment. And um, we have such a great park system in part because civic leaders had the foresight in 1903 to bring John Olmsted from the Olmsted Brothers landscape architecture firm out to the city to design a park system. And as a result, they were able to get the land early on that they needed to develop those parks. And um, so then the neighborhoods could develop around them. Seattle's first park was established in 1884, it was Denny Park. And um, it was, the Board of Park Commissioners knew that they needed to have real parks to be a city. In 1890, we'd hit about 40,000 people. We were a real town, a real going concern. And so they knew um, that in order to attract more people and industry, they needed to have a park system because that is part of what dis defined an American city at that time. And so this is a map of Seattle in 1891. And you can see, um, it, it shows the development, some of it's aspirational, but you can see where the, how much area was still available within the city limits to um, develop parks. And so the quote below in 18, from the 1892 uh, Seattle Board of Park Commissioners report shows how much they realized that parks were an important part of building the city and being considered a real city in um, the United States. And of course, us being a hinterland out in the far corner of the Northwest, Seattleites have long been concerned about being considered a real city and being taken seriously. And so not only did they know they needed to have parks, they knew they needed to have a park system. And part of that was because Frederick Law Olmsted and his partner, Calvert Vox, who had worked on uh, parks in Manhattan and in Brooklyn in the 1860s, they had made the argument to the Brooklyn Park Commissioners in 1868 that you need to have not just parks, but parkways. And they talked about, there's a quote here on the screen that talks about how those parkways need to thread through the city and connect the parks so that everybody has access to that green space as close as possible to their homes. And so the idea is, is that you never have to go more than a few blocks to get to a park landscape and then that thread can carry you to a larger park. And it's really about um, creating a framework within the city and so Seattle in the 1890s tries to develop a park system. They um, are stymied by the panic of 1893 and the economic depression that would follow, but they did get a handful of parks. Um, one of the first was Kinnear Park, um, donated by the Kinnear family on uh, Queen Anne Hill. And then there was Woodland Park, which was purchased from the Guy Finney estate and his widow Nellie Finney. And then there was, of course, Denny Park, and this shows it with the original topography um, when, before the hill was regraded, the beautiful paths through the woods. And so Seattle had those parks, um, but they didn't have the funding, they didn't have the wherewithal, um, the economic depression just grow, ground every bit of planning to a halt. And so, um, they also had an incredibly dysfunctional Board of Park Commissioners. At one point, two commissioners filed dueling annual reports because they couldn't even agree to meet. And so the park system languished in the 1890s, even though the city was growing um, at a slower pace, but it was still growing. That all changed with the 1897 Klondike Gold Rush. Um, these are boxes of gold being brought back from the Klondike. I always think of pouches, but clearly um, there was in a whole different scale than that. And what that brought was a tremendous influx of people. Um, by 1910, we would have 237,000 people in Seattle. And um, the whole city just got jump-started economic development-wise. Um, and land was being gobbled up for residential development and also for commercial development. And civic leaders really realized that if they did not seize the opportunity, to purchase land, um, they would lose the opportunity because once it was a house or a factory or a skyscraper, it was not going to revert back to parkland. And so they knew they needed to seize the moment and get that land while they could. And so they looked east as we often do in Seattle and they looked for the Olmsted name and Frederick Law Olmsted was well known all across the United States at that time. He is considered one of the founders of landscape architecture in the United States. 
And um, he was responsible, of course, for Central Park with his partner, Calvert Vox. He was also responsible for the grounds for the 1893 Columbian Exposition. And um, that was an important fair because it introduced, and Olmsted's design introduced the idea of the beautiful city and of urban planning in general to the American public. People who visited it understood that um, a city could be more than just an aggregation of businesses and homes and um, industrial development, that it could be actually a beautiful place and that that would have real implications for the overall well-being of the community, which is particularly important if you're going to have a democracy that is based on um, everybody participating and voting. You want all of those people to be well-adjusted, um, as well-developed as possible as humans. And so that is the, the bigger idea behind the park systems and urban planning at this time. And so John Olmsted worked with his stepfather, um, also his uncle, um, he married his brother's widow, for um, several years before the elder Olmsted retired. And after that, he joined with his brother, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., to form the Olmsted Brothers firm. And that is the firm that Seattle um, civic leaders reached out to in the, um, 1903 to come to Seattle and develop a park system plan. And what they got in addition to that sort of well-known name is also a really well-developed set of design principles that the elder Olmsted had developed over decades and that the younger Olmsteds had been imbued with as they worked with him and continued his legacy. And um, I love this postcard. This is the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition at the UW campus in 1909. And the view we're looking at is the Rainier Vista that is now from what is called Drumheller Fountain. It was then the Geyser Basin. And um, those buildings around it are the temporary buildings for the uh, World's Fair. But this postcard captures one of the most important of the Olmsted principles. That's the genius of place. And by organizing the fair, this vista, and the primary access for the design of the fair in alignment with Mount Rainier, Olmsted captured that thing that you can only get in that place. You can, there's no other place that you can look at that amazing vista from a high point in Seattle and look directly across the lake and the foothills out to Mount Rainier. And so you'll see that throughout the city in the parks, that he designed landscapes or located parks in places that particularly capture a um, viewpoint or an experience that you can only get in that particular place. And so Olmsted did a plan for the park system in 1903, and he did another one in 1908 after Seattle annexed those areas to the north and south of downtown. And so this plan that you're looking at here is the 1908 plan. And you'll see that there's the large parks, which are kind of those uh, darker blocks, um, and you'll recognize them as Jefferson Park and Woodland Park and Washington Park. And then they're connected with those sweeping parkways that um, connect all around the downtown core, which was already too developed to be included in the park system planning. And then, harder to see but there, are the neighborhood parks. Um, Olmsted's goal was to get a small neighborhood park within at least a, or within a half a mile of every home, and then a park for older kids with room for baseball and those sort of more um, active activities within a mile of every home. We largely succeeded. There are some gap areas that we're still working on, and those areas annexed after the 1953 are, um, have had a little bit more trouble reaching this density of parks. But the core area that Olmsted worked with, we have largely reached that goal. In 1910, Olmsted came back and did the playground report, uh, which provided guidance to the Board of Park Commissioners on how to distribute play fields around the city, and he was primarily focused on those larger play fields for the older kids. But I had to use this photo because I love that this was playground equipment in the 1900s. Um, they did not worry a whole lot about how the kids might bounce when they fell off. And so Olmsted was in Seattle from 1903. Um, he came and went until about 1913. He provided advice on how to develop the park system and how to develop the park department. Um, he helped city, the Seattle hire a park superintendent. And then um, he designed particular landscape and he provided guidance on other landscapes. So in the upper left here, you see um, Lake Washington Boulevard where Mount Baker Park and Coleman Park are. 
and um, he helped lay out the shoreline access and gave advice on the roadways and what elements the Parks Department should try and acquire. In the upper right, you see um, Foster Island, which he felt was an important space to capture because of the views that you could have across the lake that would be framed by that vegetation that grew so richly along the shoreline. In the lower left, you see Interlochen Boulevard with its original um, peeled log railings and bridge. This is before they replaced the bridges with concrete and fill. And um, he really wanted those hillside boulevards to have that rustic character because they were in the woods. And then you see in the lower right, that's Volunteer Park. That is the most formally designed of the Olmsted City Parks, and it has the most um, elaborate planting beds. It's been a little bit hard to maintain those because they are so um, intensively managed, but um, you can see that's a very familiar scene, and that experience that you have in Volunteer Park is largely what Olmsted intended. The primary park boulevard, um, not all of the boulevards were developed, but we did get a nice long stretch from Green Lake all the way down to Seward Park. And that's actually a series of boulevards. It's um, Green Lake Way connects to Ravenna Boulevard, which almost connects to Mont Lake Boulevard. There's a little jog you have to do. And then that connects to Lake Washington Boulevard that continues all the way down the um, shoreline to Seward Park. And um, one thing you can see here is the black and white pictures are just after it was developed. And um, on the upper left, you can see there the water goes right up to the edge. And on the upper right, that's a more recent picture. And it shows you that um, all the parkland that was acquired after um, the lake was lowered when the Mont Lake Cup opened in 1916. And um, Olmsted actually had a hand in getting all of that land um, acquired by the city at no cost. He mentioned that it would be a great idea to pass some state legislation that if city parkland abutted the um, newly exposed shorelands that it would automatically revert to city ownership and private property owners donated bits of land right along the shoreline to make that possible. So that's why we have such a generous uh, right-of-way on the shoreland side of Lake Washington Boulevard today. There's a number of parks along the boulevard. Um, it's intended as not only connecting those large parks, but also making an interconnected string of parks along the shore. And so you get um, Washington Park, you get Cowan Park, um, Frink Park. This is the bridge in Frink Park. And you can see along the, um, on the right-hand side, that's the plan designed by Olmsted. And you can see how he intended for the drive to snake down the um, hillside on its way to the shoreline. Um, it goes through Coleman Park and then down to the lake. And then um, if you continue on down, you get um, the other parks like Genesee Park, although it wasn't developed at the time um, that Olmsted was here. It was developed in keeping with the Olmsted principles when it was uh, made possible by later bond issues. He, Olmsted also intended the UW campus to be part of the park system, even if it was not actually owned by the city. Um, and so when he designed the AYP grounds, he um, designed them with that in mind. And you can see in the upper left that there's that strip of forest right along the shoreline, and that area was intended to have paths through it. So it would be, during the fair, a space to get a little bit of respite from the noise and bustle of crowds, but then it would continue to be a park space for the public. And then you'll notice along the eastern flank, that's on the left-hand side of the campus, he tried to keep the buildings away from that slope so that it would preserve views out across Lake Washington. He also advocated that Montlake Boulevard would continue through the campus because he felt like having the public passing through the campus would encourage them to support the university's development because they would be so impressed by what they saw. Um, university regents decided they did not want traffic passing through the park like that, and I think that probably was a good decision. Um, he um, Olmsted provided advice on the boulevards um, that snaked up and down the hillsides. Uh, he, Olmsted found various places along the primary park boulevard, Lake Washington Boulevard, where they could bring the boulevard up through the ravines. Um, Interlochen Boulevard is one of them, and you can see the photo of when it was just developed, and then a current photo um, taken more recently. 
And what he really wanted to see there was that the native vegetation would be left as much as possible. He wanted these areas that were not developed to be left as much as possible in their original form, even if that was meant augmenting a little bit with planting ground covers and that sort of thing. But the general idea was to keep it as natural looking as possible. That contrasts with the boulevards that go through residential areas, like um, there's Montlake Boulevard, uh, Beacon Avenue, and then this one, this is Magnolia Boulevard. Those that go through the neighborhoods were more formally laid out. You have the sidewalk, you have the trees that often line the um, boulevard, and he wanted those to match the surroundings. And so the whole idea is, the principle of design there is that it really should be integrated into the areas that surround it. In some parks, he recommended highly developed areas with facilities for sports and play fields and that sort of thing. In others, like this one, this is Schmitz Park in West Seattle, um, he designed only paths, essentially, that would allow visitors to get into the woods. And these are areas that um, are unprogrammed. They're meant to be places for contemplation and strolling and just wandering your way through a landscape. The play fields are interesting because they are highly developed. You can see the plan on the right, which is the Olmsted plan for this park, is the, it's incredibly programmed. There are spaces for wading pools, spaces for ball fields, other spaces for gymnasium equipment. And uh, But what's interesting is that he also, if you look in the upper left of the plan, he reserves spaces for um, vegetation, for groves of trees, for shrubbery, and that's because no park in um, the Olmsted vision should ever be just for a practical purpose. It always should have an aesthetic component so that um, the neighborhood and the park users are enriched by the experience of being in those landscapes. And so an interesting thing about looking at a historic park system is that you have um, different challenges. They are not relics of the past that we're trying to preserve um, in amber. Instead, you have to manage them with the eye toward how is the vegetation going to change as it matures? How are conditions going to change? How are communities going to change? How are you going to adapt to the needs of what communities want to be using parks for? And so um, groups like the Friends of Seattle's Olmstead Parks and other volunteer groups have worked with Seattle Parks and Recreation over the years to try and preserve the design intent, um, the function that the park was supposed to provide to the community because another Olmstead design is to make sure that park systems incorporate all different elements of how people use open space so that you don't replicate the same thing throughout the city. Instead, you have this park serves this purpose and this park serves this purpose. And those purposes in um, detail might have changed, but the function largely stays the same. And so how do we make sure that vehicles that were not part of Olmsted's life when he was in Seattle, how do we make sure that Lake Washington Boulevard can be enjoyed in the way that he intended for all users, for pedestrian, bicyclists, um, vehicles. And so we get Bicycle Sundays, which is a genius way to um, share that space and let people have the experiences that were intended. And so I have just touched on the tip of the iceberg of Olmstead history in Seattle. There are so many great stories to tell. Um, there are over 80 parks in our park system, parks and boulevards that were developed by um, Olmsted according to the plan or with landscape plans that he provided. And you can learn more about those in the Olmsted in Seattle book that we published last year with Documentary Media. You can go to historylink.org. We have many articles about the Olmsted history in Seattle and even looking more broadly in Washington State. He did lots of work in Spokane and all across the state on private residences and campuses and the state capitol campus. And you can also visit the Friends of Seattle's Olmsted Parks website. They have lots of activities planned. Um, this year, of course, is gonna be a different year, but we can look forward to the future when we can engage together in these wonderful landscapes. Thank you very much.